Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Lando. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about gout. Gout is the most prevalent type of inflammatory arthritis in the United States. Oftentimes gets to be a chronic disease due to the deposition of monosodium urate crystals inside the joint. It's not just the elevated level of uric acid in the bloodstream. This condition is frequently undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Should actually be considered in anyone who has acute arthritis. It seems to have to do with environmental factors and genetic factors. The term gout itself comes from the Latin gutta, meaning a drop of liquid. We talk about rheumatoid arthritis and how common that is. There are actually somewhere between one million and one and a half million people in the United States with rheumatoid arthritis and the incidence of hospitalization is decreasing. On the other hand, with gout, there are more than eight million people. The incidence of hospitalization is increasing it affects about 4% of the population. The incidence has increased by a factor of 2 to 4 since the 1970s. It affects somewhere between 3 to 6% of men and 1 to 2% of women. It's rare in individuals who are less than age 40. Actually, it's rare in premenopausal women. It becomes more common as we grow older. The incidence in women increases after the menopause, levels out over age 70. Seems in women over the age of menopause, the incidence is about the same as it is in men. It's about twice as common in African Americans as it is in Caucasians. With westernization, other areas of the world are starting to catch up to the United States. So areas in China and Polynesia, seems that our exports food and diet and habits are catching up to them. It seems it's more common in the springtime. If we go to some of the underdeveloped areas of the world, still less than about 1% incidence, but it's still two to six times more frequent in men than women. It seems to plateau still over age 70. Certain areas of the world where it's got relatively high incidence in Taiwan, the Taiwanese have about an 8% to 8.5% incidence of gout. The Aborigines and Pacific Islanders in New Zealand have about a double incidence, a twofold increase in the incidence compared to other ethnic groups in New Zealand. Gout is not just serum uric acid being elevated. It has to deposit as crystals inside the joint and then you have to incite the inflammatory reaction. So not even the crystals inside the joint are enough to elicit the disease. So it's complicated disease. So we start off with elevated level of uric acid in the bloodstream, but that's totally asymptomatic. Most people go for their entire life without knowing that they have elevated levels of uric acid. They don't develop gout. They don't develop any kind of symptoms, but some people do. And when the level is high enough for long enough, in some people, it precipitates out inside the joint, and then if those crystals are engulfed by inflammatory cells, you might have acute gout. That's when you have the arthritis. Then you could have advanced gout. And advanced gout is when you develop kidney disease or when you develop tophi. Tophi are masses of those monosodium uric acid crystals. And when you develop those masses, we call them tophi and they can develop underneath the surface of the skin, around the joints, in the bursa or in the tendons, or sometimes in the internal organs. And then a person can go on to develop chronic gouty arthritis with x-ray erosions of the bone. What's the normal level of uric acid? Well, in women, it tends to be less than six. In men, it tends to be less than seven. That's a good thing. What determines whether the uric acid is going to precipitate out? Well, it has a lot to do with the body temperature or the temperature of the joint at that particular location and the acidity of the joint. The uric acid concentration actually is determined by a variety of factors in the kidney and in the gut. And it seems that under excretion, not overproduction, but under excretion is the reason for elevated levels of uric acid. So the kidney isn't excreting the most appropriate amount. The gut isn't excreting the most appropriate amount. That's why you get elevated levels. 
only in less than 10% of the cases is it due to making too much uric acid, making too much uric acid in the liver or having it from increased cell metabolism, cell turnover, maybe with leukemia, maybe with psoriasis. Normally about two-thirds of the uric acid is going to be removed by the kidney, about one-third going to be removed by the gut, but only about 10% of the uric acid that's filtered from the kidney is going to end up in the urine. Most of it's going to be reabsorbed. And it's the areas of the kidney cells and the areas of the gut cells that are responsible for transporting the uric acid to the inside or to the outside. That seems to determine what your level of uric acid is going to be and your risk for developing the gout. Now, the higher level you have of uric acid, the more likely you are to develop gout. But again, the overwhelming majority of people who have elevated levels of uric acid are not going to develop gout. So only about 10% ultimately develop gout. So if your level is between 7 and 9, your likelihood is only about half of 1% per year of developing gout. If your level is over 9, your level of developing gout, your likelihood of developing gout is only about 4 to 5 percent per year. Now, most of the gout has to do with your kidney function or your gut function. Only about 10, 15 percent has to do with your diet, and that has to do with the amount of alcohol you drink or the high fructose corn syrup you consume or the kind of meat or seafood you consume. Maybe it's the anchovies or the seaweed or beer factors like that? Well, it seems that it has to do with the breakdown of what we call purines. And most of the purines are from your internal metabolism, not from the food that you eat, but from your internal metabolism. So most animals have levels of uric acid of only two or three, and that's because animals have an enzyme known as uricase. And the uricase can break the uric acid down into allantoin, and allantoin is very soluble. But humans and great apes, because of a missense mutation that occurred somewhere between 10 million and 20 million years ago, we can have higher levels of uric acid. But it's good because we don't have some of the other diseases because it seems like there was, it was a preferable mutation. So on gene-wide genome-wide association studies, it's found that there are at least 28 loci that are associated with elevated levels of uric acid. But those 28 different gene loci only account for about 7% of the variance in uric acid. So there are a lot of factors that we don't know of right now, but the major factors seem to have to do with those transporters on the kidney cells or on the gut cells. They're very important. We also have some genetic influence on the inflammatory reaction, the inflammasome that reacts. So what is gout? Gout is the acute reaction inside a joint, and typically it's when the monosodium uric crystals, when they're engulfed by the cells, the white blood cells, the macrophages, and then the neutrophils or the phagosomes, and then they cause the inflammation, typically of the bunion joint, the first metatarsophalangeal joint on the inside of your foot. And that's what we call pedagra. And then we get an inflammatory soup, and that continues it. But it seems that even if we don't treat it, the disease is self-limited. So it only lasts for about a week or two for the acute flare, and then it seems to go away. And it seems to go away because there are other kind of substances inside the cells that seem to stop the attack. And they're called the aggregated neutrophil extracellular trap structures. And those structures seem to pull out those crystals, and they start the formation, actually, of the tophi. So why do some people who have the elevated uric acid, who have the deposition of the monosodium urate in the joint, why do they develop the gout and other people don't? Well, we think it's because of changes in the temperature or the salt concentration or the level of acidity or some of the cartilage matrix components or maybe other factors in the blood or the synovial fluid that can cause the precipitation 
cause the acute reaction. And the peripheral joints seem to be more acidic and they seem to have a lower temperature than the joints, say, of your hip or your spine. So it seems that that's part of the reason. But we can get the precipitation of these monosodium urate crystals also in the tendons and in the bursa. And actually, it's not really a great idea to measure the uric acid level during the acute attack because it can fall down. It can actually, in 10% or more of individuals, right while they're having the acute attack of gout, you can have less than a level in the bloodstream of uric acid of six. So it could be said, well, it can't be gout because you have a normal level. Well, during any kind of inflammatory reaction, the uric acid level tends to go down anyway. Well, after you have the acute attack, then you get back to normal. And you can go on for a long period of time without ever having any other kind of symptoms. But if your uric acid stays high and if the monosodium uric is in the joints, well, after a period of about 10 years, you can develop some problems. And the problems have to do with those tophi. And the tophi can develop either underneath the surface of the skin or in the joint, and then you can get some complications. You can get some joint damage, joint erosion. These masses can occur on your fingertips or on your feet or around your elbow, behind the elbow or in front of the knee. They tend to be white or yellowish. They tend to be firm. You also can develop some chronic joint pain or stiffness or tenderness that can be ongoing. And then on top of that, then you can still get the acute attacks of gout. People who have gout tend to have other kinds of medical conditions as well. About three quarters of them have high blood pressure. We know a significant percentage of them are going to have a moderate decrease in kidney function, even though they don't have anything apparently wrong with their kidneys, even though they've never been told they had kidney disease. The kidney loses function as you get older. And in many people who are age 50 or 60 or above, we're going to have at least kidney disease, chronic kidney disease class 2 or stage 2. We're going to have the metabolic syndrome, obesity and diabetes going to be in a significant number of people. Whether it's cause and effect, we really don't know. And a significant percentage of people who have the gout have a history of heart disease, maybe even stroke, risk factors are your age, and menopausal status, chronic kidney disease, obesity, level of cholesterol and triglycerides, whether you have obstructive sleep apnea, significant psoriasis, exposure to lead, leukemia, lymphoma, or whether you have sickle cell anemia. What kind of medicines you're taking can precipitate attacks of gout. So if you're taking a diuretic or an ACE inhibitor, or you're taking an angiotensin receptor blocker, except for Losartan. Losartan seems to lower the uric acid if you're taking a beta blocker, if you're taking cyclosporin, even if you're taking the medicine we use to treat gout called allopurinol, that can precipitate acute attacks. Diet, as we mentioned, there are a variety of factors in your diet, especially the fructose. Fructose is the only carbohydrate that increases the serum uric acid. And now we have the high fructose corn syrup that makes up the sweetener in the sodas and in a lot of the beverages that have calories, not the diet beverages, but the beverages with calories, a lot of fatty foods. What triggers an attack? Well, an attack can be triggered by the cold. You have cold temperature of your joints, of your feet, rather than the central in your hip and your spine. You have rapid changes in the uric acid level from diuretic, maybe from trauma or surgery. Maybe you've had some chemotherapy. Maybe you have diabetic acidosis. Maybe your system is more acid. Maybe you're dehydrated. Clinically, it seems that the bunion joint, the first toe, on the inside part of the first toe, that seems to be the most common area, although some people develop the gout in the foot or in the ankle for the first attack. The attack occurs after an asymptomatic period, usually with an elevated level of uric acid over a long period of time. And then all of a sudden you have this throbbing pain and burning and extreme tenderness and swelling and heat and redness of the joint. You have difficulty moving the affected joint. 
All of these factors, remember, are the acute inflammatory response. And because it's acute inflammatory response, you can have some fever and fatigue and generalized malaise as well. Tends to be maximum intensity over a period of about 12 to 24 hours. Typically, you go to bed feeling perfectly fine and you wake in around 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and you're in terrible pain. Even the pressure of the bed sheet on your toe is cause for agony. Some people can have a brief prodrome where they think there's something wrong with the joint. They don't know what it is. You have a little mild discomfort or some tingling. But boy, when gout happens, it happens typically relatively quickly over a period of 12 hours, 24 hours at the most. That's at peak intensity. Typically in the toe, could be in the midfoot, the ankle, the knee, less commonly the wrist or the elbow or the finger, sometimes even in the bursa in the area behind the elbow in front of the knee. Early on, it tends to be only involve one joint. Later on, if the situation is not treated, then it can occur in multiple joints or in lots of joints. Over a period of time, it seems that after one or two weeks, the symptoms start to go down. Symptoms go down. Sometimes the skin peels, gets a little red, resolves. Then you're in the intercritical period. The intercritical period is when you're totally asymptomatic again. You say, Phew, we made it. But you still have an elevated serum uric acid level. And without treatment, you might have another flare. Flares become more common over time, and they can progress to those acute, I'm sorry, those advanced changes that I mentioned with the TOFI and the chronic gouty arthritis or both. What's the likelihood you're going to have a second attack? If you have a first attack, chance of a second attack within the first year is about 60%. Going to have about a 10 to 40% chance of developing kidney stones, especially if you have an acid urine. Then the TOFI can form over a period of time. Usually it takes around 10 years or more. Then you can get some of those TOFI areas underneath the surface of the skin. Sometimes they break down, and when they break down, they can drain some white cottage cheese-like material. Usually they're pain-free unless they become acutely inflamed. When they happen to be around the bone, they can cause some erosion. But typically, they're underneath the surface of the skin in the finger pads or in the feet or in the Achilles tendon area maybe in the area around the elbow, around the knee, but they also can occur in other areas. They can be in the eye or the nose or the spine or the visceral organs. They can cause some cosmetic problems. Cosmetic problems because you can't fit your shoe on because you got this lump of tofi in your ankle. Or maybe it happens in your fingers. Now you can't grip an object. Well, what triggers the second flare? Again, same sort of thing. You have an infection, you have some kind of injury, you exercise too vigorously, you become dehydrated, maybe you drink too much, your diet is a little bit off, you have an acute medical or surgical problem. Or, interestingly, you can initiate treatment or you can stop treatment for the elevated uric acid. That can precipitate gout. Complications of gout? Well, those TOFI that we mentioned, joint deformities and osteoarthritis. Some people lose some bone. You can have problems with your kidney, kidney malfunction, deterioration in kidney function, or you can develop kidney stones. Some people develop some eye involvement with conjunctivitis or uveitis. Differentiating an acute attack for the first time from a septic arthritis, well, that can be a little bit difficult. They can look and clinically basically similar but if we aspirate the joint, then we either find the uric acid crystals, and you have gout, or we find bacteria, and then you have an infection. Also, the differential includes psoriatic arthritis, a condition that's been referred to as pseudo-gout. Now, preferentially, it's called calcium pyrophosphate crystallarthritis. Lyme disease can cause a similar situation. How do we make the diagnosis? Well, if you have that large swollen joint, we can drain it, look under the microscope, see the crystals. That's a very simple way to make the diagnosis. But it all depends on storage and handling of the joint aspirate. So if the doctor doesn't do it right in the laboratory, right there at the same time in the office laboratory and in the hospital laboratory and sends it off somewhere to be read, well, that handling and the storage can make an otherwise positive reaction become negative. So that lends a problem to diagnosis. 
definitive diagnosis. You either have the TOFI or you have the problems with the monosodium uric acid crystals in the joint. But sometimes all we have is supporting evidence. So you had one joint involvement, it was the toe, you had a history of a similar attack before, you had the rapid onset of the swelling, and the redness of the joint, you're a man, maybe you have diabetes, you're overweight, maybe you uh, were involved in some kind of exercise. That can give us a hint that gout was the problem. But remember, if we measure the uric acid level in the serum during the acute attack, it oftentimes can be low. Now if we looked at the uric acid level, more than six. We find about half of men and one in six women are going to have elevated levels. So it's not just sufficient to have an elevated level. It's you have to have the elevated level and you have to have the symptoms that are at least consistent with the disease. What do we do to make the diagnosis? Mm, we do those simple things that I just talked about. We check your liver and your kidney function, make sure it's okay, check your white count, check your sugar and your cholesterol. Rarely is it appropriate or necessary to check the urine for the amount of uric acid, but sometimes if you happen to be young, say less than 25, or you have a family history of early onset gout, then it might be that you're not excreting enough uric acid so we can measure the 24-hour urine and see how much uric acid is in there and if it's less than 800 milligrams then we might want to give you some medicine to make you put out more uric acid. Well, and the kind of tests, x-rays or ultrasound or dual energy CAT scans, the x-rays don't seem to provide much information early on, just some nonspecific joint swelling. Later on in the course of the disease, after it's been around for a fairly long period, you can get some erosions in the joint. Ultrasound can give us the double contour sign. That's quite helpful. The American College of Rheumatology and the European League Against Rheumatism in 2015 came up with a score sheet, a checklist. They asked several questions about the factors that we just talked about. If you have a score of more than eight, then probably you have gout. Once you have the diagnosis, then we have to decide what kind of treatment. Well, if you're suffering from the pain and you can get to the doctor in time, then we can deal with the pain. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is what do we do for long-term management? And not all people with acute gout need long-term management. So the acute treatment, well, it's an ice pack. And in the old days, the old days up until relatively recently, we used to use colchicine a lot. Colchicine was a very commonly used drug, still is relatively commonly used, but colchicine has a lot of side effects, a lot of GI side effects, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, can suppress the bone marrow, can cause problems, especially if you have kidney impairment, and interacts with a whole bunch of other drugs. The traditional way of administering colchicine was you take two pills right away, and then you take one pill every hour for six doses but that caused a lot of problems. So they cut it down, so you take the two pills right away and just one pill at one hour. It seemed to be okay, but it wasn't any better, surprisingly, than taking a full dose of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug would be taking ibuprofen or naproxen or diclofenac. We used to use a lot of indocin, but now that's not used too much because of the frequent toxicity or we could use the COX-2 inhibitors. Those are very frequently used drugs. Decrease in the symptoms after two to four hours. You continue the medicine for a week or two. Some people get some GI side effects, irritation from medicines like the naproxen or the diclofenac. So you could take a protein pump inhibitor. Sometimes people are given injections of steroids right into the joint if it's only one joint. That could be done or you could take some prednisone uh, orally. You could do that for about five days. You can reduce the uric acid level, reduce the likelihood that you're going to have a second attack. If you drink some skim milk or low-fat milk, you do it at least every other day. You have some yogurt, maybe you have some coffee, at least four cups a day. Some people believe that consuming cherries, cherries are going to reduce the serum uric acid level modestly. They won't treat the acute attack of gout. And by the same token, vitamin C can modestly decrease the level of uric acid in the serum, but it doesn't seem to be effective for gout. But you could lose some weight, and you could change your diet, change some of the other factors. 
Well, that brings up the idea about long-term management. Now, if you don't have any symptoms, but you have elevated level of uric acid, we don't treat that. If you happen to have more than one attack of gout a year, <clears throat> or if you have the TOFI, or if you have stage two or greater kidney disease, or if you have a history of kidney stones, then it's probably a good idea to begin some form of therapy. And the new concept in therapy is we treat to target. We don't just lower your uric acid. We lower your uric acid specifically to, for most people, six. At a level of six, we're going to dissolve the monosodium uric crystals. We're going to dissolve some of the TOFI. We're going to suppress the likelihood of flares. In some people, if they have very severe disease, we reduce it even to a target level of five. In Europe, in Britain, they don't begin the uric acid lowering therapy until about two weeks after the acute attack. Here in the United States, we begin treatment right away. We test the uric acid level monthly until we get to the target dose. And because the acute medicines, or the medicines for the, the gout, the medicines that are going to bring the uric acid level down, they can precipitate attacks early on. So as a result, we keep you on prophylactic therapy for three to six months, three to six months of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, but now not at the full dose, at the lower dose, or we use the colchicine instead of the acute treatment. We use maybe a pill once a day or once every other day, or we could use low dose of corticosteroids, low dose of prednisone. The order that I mentioned them is the order that we use for treatment. If we begin a medicine for a chronic lowering of the uric acid, well, the likelihood of your complying with the therapy is only somewhere between about 10 and 50 percent at the best. People perceive that they only need the medicine when they have the flare. Once they feel better, they stop taking the medicine because they're taking too many other drugs because they have other kinds of diseases. They have diabetes and they have high blood pressure and taking medicines for that. People think that they're going to be able to successfully change their lifestyle lose weight, mm, that ain't going to happen. They lose confidence when they're taking the medicine and they have the flare, because remember, the treatment can precipitate the flare. That's why you use the prophylactic or the suppressive therapy for three to six months. If we begin therapy, there are three basic classes of medicine. We use the xanthane oxidase inhibitors. They prevent the production of uric acid. That's medicine like allopurinol. For a while, there was a popular medicine called Euloric. It came on the market in 2009 to challenge allopurinol. It's thought to be a safer medicine. But in February of 2019, the FDA sent out a warning, said, hey, you've got to put a black box on there because the all-cause mortality, the likelihood of dying taking this medicine is higher than it is taking the allopurinol. So do be careful. So Euloric fell to a second or third place status. There's uricosauric medicine. Uricosauric medicine is a medicine that helps the kidney excrete the uric acid. And that seems to be quite helpful in some patients. It's not really uh, nearly as widely used as the allopurinol. And then we have some fancy medicines that are analogs of the uricase. The uricase is that enzyme that the animals have that we don't. And those are given intravenously, and they're quite expensive. They have some side effects, of course. The allopurinol, that's the standard therapy. It's rapidly metabolized to an active compound in the body. The active compound is oxypurinol. In some people, it's associated with a rash, so it has a little bit of a bad name, but it's still the standard of therapy. It can cause what's known as the allopurinol hypersensitivity syndrome, or reaction. It occurs typically within the first week of, first eight weeks of taking the medicine, especially in people if they have bad kidney function or if they're started at a relatively high dose or if they happen to be Korean or Han Chinese, they seem to have more likelihood of having a certain genetic abnormality or genetic variant and that seems to predispose them to problems with allopure and also caution is necessary because the condition can be devastating cause a rash where your skin falls off, you develop hepatitis and pneumonitis and bone marrow toxicity. 
as fair degree of mortality associated with that, but not if we start at a very low dose, a dose of maybe 50, 100 milligrams, slowly increase it. It used to be that the dose was only increased to about 300 milligrams and then people stopped. But now remember, we treat to target. We don't treat to the dose of the medicine, we treat to the target. So if we have to go to 400, 500, or 600 milligrams, that's okay. We just monitor people and we treat appropriately. We try to bring that uric acid level down to prevent the recurrence of gout. But remember, in those people who've had more than one attack or who have other risk factors, second line of therapy would be the uricosauric. That would be a drug like the probenicid. Probenicid is good for people who are excreting lower levels of uric acid than they should. So if they have less than 800 milligrams of uric acid excreted in the urine every day, then probably it's a good idea to consider a drug like this, but probably not if a person has kidney stones already because it can make that worse. It's a pain in the neck to take it because you have to take two pills a day, one morning, one night. And if you have decreased kidney function, well, the drug might not work quite as well. But there are some alternatives, Losartan, that angiotensin receptor blocker used for high blood pressure, phenofibrate, a drug used for elevated cholesterol and triglycerides, also makes more uric acid go out in the urine. So that's good. We don't want to lower the uric acid too low, so not to less than three, because a uric acid level less than three has been associated with some neurodegeneration or the onset of Parkinson's disease. So a lot of questions still remain with regard to gout. Why do some people who have high uric acid level develop gout and other people don't? Why, if you have gout, do you go for a long period of time before you have a flare? All of those questions remain to be answered. But that's the story of gout. It's common disease, more common than most people assume. It's more than just an elevated level of uric acid. It's a disease that's related to the precipitation of those monosodium uric crystals in the joint, typically in the toe, maybe the ankle, maybe the knee. And then it's the body's response. So it's not just the deposition. It's the response to those crystals when they get gobbled up by the cells. Your diet has a role to play in the development of gout. How important the role is, we just don't know. If you have an acute attack, it seems like the non anti-inflammatories are probably as good as anything else, probably safer than a lot of things. If there's a reason to lower the uric acid, remember, you have to have a good reason, you have to have the gout, you have to have some other kind of reason, not just elevated level of uric acid, but if you do need to lower it, allopurinol is still the drug of choice. Remember, we're going to treat to target so we're not going to treat to just the level of 300 milligrams of that drug a day. We're going to treat to bring the uric acid level down to six. If you're interested in more about allopurinol, we have a show on that too. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend. Consider subscribing so that you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.